Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Agam Patel, and I'm the Associate Director here at UTR's Palm Desert Center. And I'm very glad to welcome all of you to the first of our UCR Brain Game Center lectures with the Center's Director, Professor Aaron Seitz. Professor Seitz earned his bachelor's degree in theoretical mathematics from Reed College, his PhD in computational neuroscience from Boston University, and conducted his postdoctoral work in systems neuroscience at the Harvard Medical School. He was also a research assistant professor at Boston University before coming to UCR in 2008. While his primary appointment is in psychology, he holds cooperative appointments in bioengineering, biomedical sciences, computer science, the interdisciplinary neuroscience program, as well as psychiatry. He's also the director of the UCR Aging Initiative, as well as UCR's Brain Games Center. And he'll be sharing more with you about his work tonight and in more programs to come. We would like to acknowledge Bob and Cheryl Fay for their continuing generosity in supporting this programming at UCR Palm Desert Center, as well as the work at the UCR Brain Games Center. Additionally, we at UCR would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Kauia, Tongva, Lusenyo, and Serrano peoples and their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. All right, take it away, Aaron, and I would like to introduce him to present his lecture. Great, thanks. Just give me a moment to share my screen. Great, thanks for everyone being here tonight. Um, and tonight I'm going to talk mostly about vision um, and some of the work about vision training that we've done at the Brain Game Center, um, really looking at the question of how training vision can help us see better. And first I wanna tell you a little bit about the UCR Brain Game Center. And this is a relatively new Kind of research unit on the UCR campus. We've been around for about five years and our goal really is to do principal research design, test, and disseminate evidence-based approaches to understand and train brain fitness in a way that will benefit real life activities. And so our goal is a little bit different than when I first came to UCR. And so actually I'll tell you tonight a little bit about some of the journey that I took from basic lab research, where my primary questions were understanding mechanisms about how the visual system worked um, and, you know, what are the circumstances in which the vision system can be trained. Um, and then when I got to the Brain Game Center and started that, it was really asking this different question of how can we translate understanding of science and scientific principles to things that could really help us with the activities that we do in the world. And so the Brain Game Center right now um, is a growing organization. So we have about 50 or 60 undergrad researchers who work with us every quarter. We have four full-time programmers to develop our software. We have two research coordinators, lots of graduate students and postdocs. And every year we're growing. And today I'm telling you about vision. But what I like about this slide is it really kind of makes the point that essentially everything that we do is based upon circuits in the brain functioning well. And so there are kind of basic processes like vision and hearing and attention to memory, but also more complex things like language skills, emotion regulation, happiness and well being are all things that potentially can be improved by figuring out how the brain mediates these functions and improving the processes that the brain 
does to give rise to these. In this talk series, tonight I'll be talking about vision and vision training. Then in March, we'll move on to hearing. And then in April, we'll have another talk talking more about memory. And all of these are focused on this kind of exciting field that often goes by the term brain training. And the basic idea here is that as we understand more about neuroscience and psychology, there's more possibilities to come up with ways to train the brain to work better. And an analogy often made, and so this is why you could see um, the brain you know, running on a treadmill or lifting weights, is that this might parallel what knowledge of muscle physiology and the cardiovascular system did to physical fitness um, over the last century, where essentially understanding how these body systems worked have given rise to training regimes that have made athletes run faster, jump higher, uh, be more endurant than ever before. And so the big question is, can we do this in terms of brain, training the brain? And it's worth noting that, you know, we've always done things to try to keep ourselves mentally sharp. And so we have many approaches like Mensa puzzles, Sudoku, crossword puzzles. I played the Simon game a lot as a kid, reading books. And while all of these are good activities, one of the limitations of a lot of these is that if you train a lot on Sudoku, you'll be better at Sudoku, but it doesn't transfer so much to activities outside of Sudoku. And so what's been happening over the last decade, especially, is that there's been more and more companies popping up that use kind of neuroscience inspired games. And that, you know, these range from Lumosity, where I'm sure you've seen ads for those. Um, Brain HQ is one from Posit Science. I think they have a program for that in the Palm Desert Library. Um, there's others like CogMed and Jungle Memory that are targeted more toward kids. And that there's a lot of excitement because uh, we now have a multi billion dollar market where people are selling programs that promise to be able to improve your brain fitness. There's also a lot of controversy in terms of whether these really work as advertised. A few years ago, there was a, stamp, there was a statement that came from the Stanford Institute of Longevity and the Max Planck Institute for Human Development that was really criticizing the commercial brain training industry. And there's really two parts of this quote that I want to focus on. One is that they thought there wasn't any compelling scientific evidence to date. This is about four years ago. Um, that these training programs do as they promise. And the other thing was the encouragement to continue to care for research and validation in the field. And so the statement wasn't saying brain training doesn't work. It was that a lot of things have come on the market that are promising, but very few of them have been studied well enough to understand does it work or not? Or if so, who does it work for? Which people are good candidates for these types of trainings? And so one of the key goals of the Brain Training Center or the Brain Games Center is to do this research so that we can have a better understanding of which approaches might work for which individuals. And the biggest criticism of the field has been this idea of specificity. And I'll bring up this term kind of a few times during the talk. Um, the first case I want to bring up is in memory training, which will be my last lecture. But I want to bring this up now just because it helps bring up the examples that have been a big issue in the field. And that is, in this situation, each of these black squares is a computer screen that you see in the series. And so if you could see my mouse, basically you start at the left, and you're supposed to remember the location of this little blue square inside the black square. The next screen, it's a different location. And in this task, you're supposed to indicate at each time whether the one you see now is the same as we saw two items ago. So right now, this third one matches the first one. The fourth, though, doesn't match the second. The fifth doesn't match the third. But then the sixth matches the fourth again. And so this is a task you do with each item you say, you know, did I see this two items ago? 
When people train on this task, and this is one we use a lot in our lab, what we find is that um, people improve. And so this is showing a bunch of college students over about 20 days on this task. And what we see is they start off, they could remember items that they saw three times ago. By the end of training, they could remember items they saw about five items ago. And so this is great. But the big question is, you do this task over and over again, you get better. Then you go to a grocery store, try to remember what was on your shopping list. And do you remember? And, you know, as I'll discuss across these different talks, the answer is sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. And that's what we're trying to research. And so the way I got started in this field really is what are the things that we could do to make it so that these brain training games truly have real world impact? You do something on your computer or in my psych lab to train. And we want you to be able to then go about the activities in your life and that you'll be able to do those better. And so the reason why I put this vision talk first is because there's a lot that we could learn from research that's been done in vision training. And so this is the field that I kind of grew up with as a scientist. And so I did some of this work in my PhD and then my postdoc and then I first came to UCR and that this area of research really makes the observation that for you to see, so vision involves a collaboration between the eye and the brain. We all know that if the eye is not working properly, so that light is not being focused on the back of your retina, that you might need glasses like I'm wearing, um, or sometimes cataract surgery or LASIK surgery. Um, and there's a huge number of approaches that are used to focus light better in the back of your eye. We know this is important. At the same time, whether it's due to a stroke that does damage the visual cortex, um, or you know, even with aging, that if the brain is not doing its part, that we can't see. And so the contribution that the brain makes to seeing is something that is not as appreciated in optometry. So you know, we have this giant multi-billion dollar industry once again that is focused on you know, glasses, contacts, LASIK, cataract surgery, et cetera, and so on. But in terms of the brain's contribution to vision loss, there is not nearly as much that's understood and not as many offerings on the market. And the other thing is that there's a lot of research in this field of perceptual learning we'll talk a little bit more about that does show that you can train the brain to more efficiently process the information that comes to the eyes. Some very simple examples is that, so here you have four pictures in front of you. And in each picture, there's an animal. And that, um, you know, three of them are birds, um, one of them isn't. And I wanna give you a little bit of time to see if you could find, you know, the dominant animal in each scene. I'll show you what the answers are. And so you could see there's a giraffe and then um, a snowbird and a couple of owls. And the reason I'm showing this is that all of you have just experienced perceptual learning. If I show you the same slide a year later, and some of you might have even seen my talks in the past where I've shown this, that you'll be able to find these birds um, in the giraffe immediately. Your brain has changed based upon this experience. This is only one aspect of perceptual learning. Another aspect of perceptual learning is that if you notice, especially you know, the birds, that they're camouflaged. And in order to be able to find something in camouflage, you can also train yourself to better represent the image of the bird, find the subtle orientations and um, changes in light intensity that help distinguish the bird from the background. And that if you're able to master this, then instead of just being able to find the birds in these particular pictures, you'll be able to find birds more generally. And in fact, you know, that's an example of what happens with radiology. So here, you know, I have a picture of a femur bone 
um, and they're the metastases on this. And so these are kind of cancerous outgrowths of the bone. If you look at this, you could try to come up with some hypothesis of you know, where might be those cancerous regions. I could show those to you and um, then I could take them away. And you could look and you could recognize, yeah, so some parts of this image were a little bit darker. Um, you know, maybe that's how I identify the cancer, but you'll see there's other parts that are also darker than surrounding that are not the cancerous pieces. And so with a radiologist, they have to train for years really, you know, looking at often hundreds of thousands of images to be able to learn not just how to, you know, recognize cancer on a particular image, but they need to be able to, you know, really improve just their basic vision of the subtle changes in light intensity that are able to help them see, you know, what is um, cancerous, what is not, what is benign, what is malignant. And this is something that takes training. In the lab, we study this in much more simple examples. So if you look towards the right, so you should see these red dots at the top. I have my mouse moving around one of those. Hope you can see it. You should see a subtle orientation pattern kind of tilted a little bit to the left. If you then follow the red dots towards the left of the screen, you should be able to find that image again and then again, but like it becomes harder. And so eventually it just fades into the background. And so this is one of the ways that we're able to measure aspects of people's vision because we could come up with what we call a psychometric function. And so what this is, is that on the x-axis, you have signal strength. So how strong this oriented pattern is compared to the noise. And then on the y-axis, you have performance. How often are you able to recognize it? And so the typical lab approach that we've done is that we first try to estimate this function for each person of essentially what they could do easily, what is more difficult. And then we train them for a period of time. And we try to look to see whether this psychometric function changes. So here with the blue line after training, we're seeing an observation where they're now able to see, you know, at the same signal strength, performance is now improved. And just kind of taking a step back, why would we do this? And there's a bunch of different reasons that have been in the field. So some kind of where I started off with was you could actually understand aspects of specific brain processes by looking at what learning is specific to. And I'll bring up an example of that you know, in a moment. Um, also, what's been a big focus of my research is understanding mechanisms of learning. And I'll show you an example of this as well, but what we find is sometimes you train people and they don't learn. Other times you train people and they do learn. What's nice about perceptual learning is it's slow. And also there's actually many failures in literature where people have tried training where it hasn't worked. And by looking at the differences of successes and failures, we're able to understand what are some of the basis processes in the brain that give rise to learning. The other things, and this is really what has been the focus of the Brain Game Center, is to develop training techniques for populations requiring specialized sensory skills. Radiologists would be an example. Um, I'll also show you baseball players a little bit later in my talk. And then also clinical applications to rehabilitation patients with sensory deficits. So there's large numbers of people who are not satisfied with their vision. There's some people who have very severe visual deficits. And that if we're able to unlock um, you know, plasticity of the brain so that we train people so that the brain will work more efficiently, this can complement the other visual aids that we use to give rise to better outcomes for people. The first little kind of research nugget that I wanna give you in this talk gets to how we select what to learn. And I'll briefly tell you about a study that was actually part of my job talk when I came to UCR of about 12 years ago. And it was really looking at this idea of reinforcement learning that a lot of people know about Pavlov and the dog and that basically, you know, a sound will 
give get the dog to start salivating because it always preceded food coming. And so this is something that's been used a lot to kind of understand complex behaviors. But there hasn't been a lot of work on whether kind of reinforcement learning can do things like change how you see things. And so this is a former researcher I worked with, um, Don Ho Kim, who's kind of demonstrating the apparatus we use in this study. So he has his chin in a chin rest, his forehead kind of against a bar, he has this tube in his mouth. And the reason he has a tube in his mouth is that the participants in the study were food and water deprived um, before they came in, which typically meant that they just kind of skipped breakfast and didn't drink anything in the morning. And they had come into the lab and the first thing they would drink that day would be little drops of water coming through this tube. And so this is our reward because if you're thirsty, a drop of water is rewarded. And so what we want to see is that if all you have is that you get this drop of water through a tube, and then we show them a screen like this, where you see that every so often kind of around the red dot, there's one of these oriented patterns I showed you before. And there's one, there's another. And so there's two different orientations. One of those orientations was always paired with a drop of water. So it would show up, you get a drop of water. The other one um, did not have that reward. And so we're able to study here is the difference between the experience of one orientation that's rewarded, another one that isn't. But we wanted to make it so that people did not have any idea what stimulus was rewarded. Because right now you can see that um, these orientations are identifiable. So we use this technique called continuous flash suppression. And the basic idea here is to one eye, we showed this bright flickering modern pattern. So it's colorful, it's vibrant. Um, and so this is really a good stimulus to the visual system. To the other eye, and it's really hard to see, but if you look in the center, you could see this still noisy pattern and sometimes this orientation will show up. But the key thing is that if we show to the left eye, this bright mantra, and to the right eye, just this you know, low contrast gray screen, what you perceive is just the mantra. So this is there's a lot of literature on what's often called binocular rivalry. And essentially what this is, is that if you show different information to the two eyes, the brain doesn't know how to deal with any compatibility. And so the solution typically is that it will choose one eye and that's what you'll perceive for that period of time. And so we're able to use this little trick so that people came into a lab, in this case, 20 days. Every day they're food and water deprived. They, all they did was just stare at a screen, got drops of water through a tube. It's a pretty boring task, actually. Um, they never saw the stimulus that was paired with the reward. And we asked the question is, well, if we test them before and after on a visual stimulus, can we see evidence of learning? And so here this plot is a little complex. I'll walk you through it. So, at the very bottom of the screen, you're seeing something like I showed you before. You have those red dots around them. You have noise with the orientation. Towards the right, you could probably make out the orientation. Towards the left, it's probably too subtle. So this is basically showing that same psychometric curve that I showed you before. However, if we look on the left plot, so under the words trained orientation, what we see in blue is the pretest. And in red, we see the post test. And so we see with this um, you know, psychometric function that it got better, just like the slide I showed you earlier, from before we did this training to after. But the key thing is this training, all that involved was drops of water coming through a tube to unseen stimulus, but improved people's vision. On the other hand, if you look at the control orientation, this was shown equal numbers of time. It's the orientation that never got those drops of water there. There's not much of a change. 
And so this is important in that it tells us a basic principle that we could learn without attention just through stimulus reward contingencies. This learning can make us see better. At the same time, as I'll kind of bring up in a moment, um, it's important to realize that this is learning that only occurred for one orientation. And in fact, it only occurred for the trained eye. And so it's highly specific. Um, so this particular example doesn't transfer very well to untrained tasks. But the reason I'm showing you this is that it's kind of a little bit of my origin story is that before I started the Brain Game Center, I did lots of experiments like this. And so like the one I just showed you was talking about you know, learning through reward. There's other studies that we've done looking at how attention, so focusing on things you wanna learn will help you learn them better. Or multi-sensory facilitation. So how if you have sounds that complement the visual image, that those will help you learn visual stimuli better. And there's other aspects that, you know, video games will improve motivation. Um, and, you know, this is kind of a lot of the basic science research that I do. But all of this gives us information about how the brain learns, what will make the lear brain learn more efficiently or less efficiently, or sometimes even generalize more or less. So moving past this, is how can we take this example I just showed you that's showing a very specific aspect of learning to guide an approach that will give rise to real world vision. So as I told you before, I wanna be able to train you in a laboratory task and then set you loose in the world and have you be to see better. And so, Next thing I want to kind of mention is that if you start looking at this field of visual perceptual learning that I mentioned, that almost anything that you could come up with that involves vision, someone like me has done a training study on. So acuity would be the smallest gap in these C's that you could see, or contrast is you know how much light you need to be able to resolve this um, oriented pattern. Um, you could have stimuli and noise. They could be simple stimuli like I've shown you before or faces. It could be motion stimuli, stereo, color, textures, complex figures, you name it. Wine tasting, in fact. So there's you know, research that shows, and we kind of all know this to some extent, that you could train people to better distinguish flavors and wines. And that you get better at this. And you know, the downside is that you kind of appreciate the cheap wines a little bit less, but it's another perceptual task we could improve on. The hallmark though, is this issue of specificity, is that a lot of the studies in this field will have effects similar to what I showed you before. So you might have specificity of location. So I could train you, so you're always looking at this red dot. And so the, the stimulus that's trained is always in lower right-hand visual field. If I then test you at an untrained location, let's say the upper left-hand visual field, the learning doesn't necessarily transfer. You have to start over. Orientation is what I showed you with the reward study, is that you rotate the stimulus, and the benefits of the training of the first one don't transfer to the second. The most interesting kind of exquisite example of specificity and vision is the eye of training. And the reason why this is so interesting is that go back to this kind of example monopoly really rival with that I showed you, is that it both shows that the eyes kind of compete for what we're able to perceive. But other studies also indicate that this shows we don't have conscious awareness of what eye we're looking at. So if I showed you a stimulus that was different between the two of your eyes and asked you, whether you're seeing in your left eye or right eye, you don't know this. But I could you know, give you an eye patch or use a fancy setup with mirrors that will show different stimuli to one eye versus the other and train you for a period of time, in this case, just in the left eye. And then start training again on the right eye. And what we see is the learning will often kind of start over. 
there's some savings here. So like if you look carefully, you could see that the curve on the right grows a little bit more quickly than the curve on the left. But a lot of the research, and once again, you know, the study that I mentioned with the liquid reinforcement, the drops of water through the tube, that was an example where the learning was specific to one eye that was trained and not the other. And this has been fascinating to scientists like myself in terms of what it tells us about where in the brain and the brain processes related to this learning. But from the perspective of trying to get real world benefits, if I told you you could come into my lab and that I train you for a month, and that after that month, all you'd be able to do is better recognize a stimulus if it's presented to the lower right hand visual field of just your left eye, but not your right eye, you, you might not be so happy with that type of result. And so we start asking the question, why is this learning so specific? And one of the answers is that we always use very simple stimuli. So, you know, ones like whether two lines are aligned or whether you detect this, you know, low contrast stimulus or the stimulus and noise. And that when you think about it, if your training experience is that all you ever see as a case example, why should you generalize? No computer learning program would generalize from that. Um, you know, in other domains of our life, you know, if we learn, you know, somebody's name, you know, we don't necessarily think that all of the humans have that same name. Um, maybe developmental stages as kids, you see this, but not in adults. And so there isn't a reason for the system to generalize in these cases. And, you know, from the research perspective, um, people like myself and other people studying perceptual learning weren't always looking for things that generalize. Because if it didn't generalize, we actually learn more about what's happening in the visual system from that. And so as I move from let's understand basic mechanisms to let's apply these to help people, we start thinking about a design principle of what would we need to do in order to be able to get learning that will transfer. And so with this, I wanna give you just a very brief neuroscience lesson about how the brain sees. And so I'm using this term basis function, um, which is something that um, as a GOMS introduced me that like I was a math major. And so a basis function really is just what are the dimensions that are necessary in order to define a space? And so like the most simple example of this is we're all familiar with Cartesian graphs, right? So you have X coordinates and you have Y coordinates. And so if you know the X location, the Y location, that tells you any point in that space. X and Y is a basis function. If we want to have three dimensions, X, Y, and Z is our basis function. So from a very, so it's a complex word to just describe the simple process of, you know, what are the dimensions of the things that we want to train? And so it's a little bit complex if we want to understand the dimensions that the brain uses to see. But we know a lot from neuroscience. So here in this picture, you can see lights coming to the eyes. It goes to the back of the head. So if we look at the neocortex, this area labeled V1, right in the back of my head, is the first part of neocortex that is able to see. And there's been a lot of studies looking at this primary visual cortex. One of the most basic um, studies was look, understanding what's now called retinotopy, another fancy word. All that, what this means is that if you look at this grid on the left here by my mouse, that this was a pattern that was flickered on and off to the eye of an animal. And then if you look on the right, this little wedge is kind of a representation of visual cortex in the animal. And that the black parts are the parts that were active while this pattern was flashing. And the fact that we could see, it's a distorted picture, but essentially a picture of what was shown to the eye on the surface of the brain 
shows that neighboring cells in the retina project to neighboring cells in visual cortex. And so that's what we call it retinotomy. So the first dimension of the space's function is a map of space. So it's our x, y coordinates. The next thing is what happens if you stick an electrode into the brain and you record activity of an individual neuron at some place in the visual cortex. What you'll find is that not only does it respond well to the location, it responds well to the orientation of stimuli. So you know, some cells will like stimuli when they're vertical, some horizontal. Um, so if you look at these pictures under the word orientation, it's just showing you that, you know, these fuzzy blobs that I keep on showing, you know, when they're rotated at different orientations, that different cells like different orientations. And this is an, another important dimension by which the visual system breaks down the world. The last one um, is a little bit more complex. It's what we call spatial frequency. And so, if you look at these fuzzy blobs again, you'll see that some of the lines are kind of you know, wide and others of the lines are somewhat narrow. And different cells have preferences, some preferring the wider ones, some preferring the narrow ones. And while this is interesting, is that if you have a set of filters like this that are specified by the location, orientation, spatial frequency, you could describe any picture, at least in this case, any black and white picture by this set of filters. And a case example of how this works, and we use this every day, is JPEG compression. So if you, you know, with my iPhone, I take a picture of something and to compress that picture to save disk space, instead of saving the highest resolution image it can, instead it compresses it. And the way it compresses it is actually modeled off of understanding of how the visual system works. So here's a picture of a woman's face and eyes. You see that there's a grid. At each grid location, we apply a filter bank. And so that's what I see show on the upper left. You start looking at the filter bank, this first column what you see is that they're all horizontal. It's just the spatial frequency is changing. The first row, they're all vertical. The spatial frequency is changing. And then these plaids you find in the middle, they're mathematically equivalent to different orientations. And so what happens is that in each spot, you see how well matched each of these filters are to that location. And so that's what these numbers are on the grids. And you see that you know there's different locations that have different numbers in them. And so essentially, this is sufficient to compress images. And there's some thought that this is why the visual system works this way, is that it's able to represent the visual world a little bit more efficiently by breaking it down into these pieces. And so what we thought then was, well, if this describes kind of the space of spatial vision, maybe we should train across all these different dimensions. And so a few years back, I actually started a company where we created a game called Ultimize. Um, I could tell you a story about the company another time, but we created a replacement for that um, at the Brain Game Center a program called Sightseeing, which is actually one of our free downloads on the Apple App Store. And that you could see what's happening in this game is that these, you know, this cursor is going around and kind of blowing up these kabuk. So um, sometimes they're hidden with distractors, sometimes they're kind of low contrast. But what we do is that across these screens, we have different orientations, different locations, different spatial frequencies. And then we also try to make it so that the targets are paired with reward, that we actually have sounds that help reinforce the location of the visual stimuli. So we took a lot of these other learning principles and we built them all into this game with the idea that we want to create a training program that would give rise to the most learning possible. 
And so that's our hypothesis. This game would be sufficient to be able to train vision. The next thing we want to do was come up with something that people did in the real world that we could test them on and see what they got better. And so for those of you who have been in the UCR community for a while, you might know Doug Smith, who was our former baseball coach. And so we talked with him about, um, well, hey, can we get your baseball team to join our science experiment? And that we'll train them and see whether they can make their vision better. And you know, he was relatively skeptical at first. Um, but you know, after a number of conversations explaining that you know, vision training was something that was actually done in certain ways in a lot of the major league teams, that you know, he decided to give us a shot. And so we had the UCR baseball team come into our psych lab for about um, 20, 25 minute sessions. Um, and this is in the fall of 2012. So in between the 2012 and 2013 baseball season. And that we're able to test their vision before and after this training, and then also look at their playing performance in the Big West League um, you know, before and after this training. If we first look at basic vision, in this case, acuity, so how well you can read an eye chart, you know, this is a little bit of a complex graph, but what we're showing in the green is that for the trained players, and these were the hitters, that there's about a 30% improvement in their distance vision and about 20% improvement in their near vision. The untrained players, actually in this case with the pitchers of the team, didn't show any changes from training. And so what this meant was that the players were able to stand basically a little bit further back from an eye chart and read the same line. So some of the players actually got down to 27 and a half, 27 and a half vision. So what a normal person could read from seven and a half feet, they could stand 20 feet back and read. And what this meant in reality was that some of these players had to stand 40 feet back from our eye chart because you know our eye chart, the lowest line was um, 15. And so we had to have them go twice the distance in order to be able to um, see the stimulus. Um, the next thing we looked at, so I was just kind of talking about something happening with, okay, there we go, that, you know, there's this basis function of vision. And so like contrast sensitivity is something that sometimes they measure uh, when you go to the eye doctor, sometimes they don't. But if you look at this picture where you could see something really interesting is towards the left, you could only kind of see the bright parts fairly low um, in the graph. And as you go to the middle, you could basically see almost to the top. And you go to the right, you probably need once again, a lot more light to be to see it. And so this is a function that describes the spaces function a little bit better than just acuity. And that we want to kind of measure this to see, you know, kind of how well can people see in different lighting conditions. And so what we saw was this function also improved. And so this is one of the first kind of tests of whether kind of the space of this function you're trying to train, you know, was changing the way that we we're hoping. Key question, is it improved baseball? And so, as I mentioned, um, you know, we don't have a control group within the UCR team, um, but we do have a control group when we look at the rest of the Big West League. And so if we first look at strikeouts, what we saw was there is a statistically significant difference in strikeouts or change in strikeouts between the Big West League and the Riverside team where basically we had about a four and a half percent reduction in strikeouts year over year uh, between 2012 and 2013. Then we could start using some of these money ball statistics. Um, and so there, there's a calculation you can make called runs created per out. And basically what this does is it gives you an estimate of how many runs they should have gotten um, from their hitting if you ignore fielding. And so we could see is that if you compare the change between 2012 and 2013 for all the players of the UC Riverside team that played both years versus all the players in the Big West League that played both years that weren't on the Riverside team, that this change was larger 
for Riverside than it was for Big West. And what's cool about this runs created per out is that there's something called the Pythagorean theorem of baseball. And so you could basically take the runs created per out. You could compare that to the runs allowed, so the number of runs that other teams scored on us. And you could compute how many games we should have won based upon that performance. And you could do this both assuming that we improved at the rate that we actually did improve, or you could pretend that we only improved as much as the Big West League did. And the difference between those is 4.7 games out of a 54 game season. And so the you know, nice example here is that not only are the baseball players improving on our kind of lab-based test division, we're able to measure something they did in the real world and find that they got better at this activity. And so kind of the summary of some of the vision studies that you know, we've done in the past, you know, they help tell us that the adult visual system shows a great deal of plasticity. It's able to change through experience. But these lab-based studies often have a different goal than those of clinical practice. So if the lab-based study is trying to understand, you know, can we find something that's specific to one eye, it's not that useful if you then try to apply that exact method to training people in the real world because we know it's going to be specific. But if you come up with a new model and come up with you know, a question of what are the types of things we'd want to train so that it has a good chance of transfer, it's a different design process, then we are able to come up with things that will have you know, real world relevance. And so research always continues and so I just want to kind of mention just a few details of some of our ongoing studies. So one study, and this is one where, you know, we're actively recruiting people uh, to move forward with, is what we call mediators and moderators of perceptual training. And so just to give you a sense of what this means, the moderators, these are all the individual differences in them. So if you have two people, who train on the same program, they're expected to get different results. I mean, this is something we know, not everybody is the same. These aren't well appreciated. A lot of studies like the ones I showed you, we just average across people and we get, you know, what's the average effect? But individual differences are really important if you want to help people in the world because you're helping different people. And so you need to figure out what works best for them. Mediators are the different ways of training people. And so what we're doing both with the vision study and later I'll tell you we're doing similar things with the memory studies is we're trying to get a bunch of diverse people to enroll in our studies. And we assign them to a bunch of different training approaches. Sometimes each person gets just one training approach. Sometimes people actually get two different training approaches. But we can now start asking this question is what are the things that we could identify about each individual that might be propensity of learning more from one training approach versus another? Um, or you know, maybe some people, none of these approaches will help, and other people, all of them. But we really want to be able to achieve this personalization. And so this new study that's funded by the National Eye Institute um, is giving us the opportunity to do a bunch of studies. And actually, these ones aren't gamified. Um, they're you know, fairly simple training approaches. But they help give us the basic information that will help us come up with different approaches that are going to be appropriate for the needs of different individuals. There is another study that we've been running a lot of this um, actually out in um, Rutgers and Rochester um, in New York um, is vision training and schizophrenia. So there are some specific visual deficits, um, impairments in people with schizophrenia that some of them are actually with these low contrast stimuli that I showed you. Others are configural representations 
and that we're trying to both see whether vision training can reduce these visual impairments and then also see, well, if we do this, does it reduce schizophrenic symptoms um, as well? And we're actually using similar approaches, um, and a lot of these are in collaboration with Catherine Servopoulos um, at UCR, is in this case, it's not as much focused on training, although we hope to do this at a later stage. But what we're trying to do is understand different aspects of vision and autism. And so for instance, a lot of people think about autism primarily as kind of a mental health issue that affects social processes, right? I mean, so one of the things that is stereotypical about um, individuals with autism is a difficulty recognizing the meaning of facial expressions. When we start thinking about that, recognizing someone's facial expression is a very, very difficult visual task. And so our hypothesis, and there's some really good evidence for this, is that individuals with autism process visual information a little bit differently. And so what we've been finding is that there's some visual tasks they do better at than people who don't have autism. And others they do worse at. And so that, you know, this idea here is, you know, kind of with neurodiversity is that they just see the world a little bit differently. And so we're trying to understand those, try to see which ones might give rise to some of these difficulties recognizing facial expressions. And then at a later stage, we hope to do training there as well. Um, and so I want to you know, first kind of thank um, a lot of the people. And in fact, I need to find a picture that shows even more of our students, um, but um, you know, I have the UCR baseball team here that, um, you know, helped us do the vision study. Dan Ozer, he's now the chair of psychology. He's the one who taught me the Pythagorean theorem of vision, or of, I'm sorry, Pythagorean theorem of baseball. Um, and also the funding agencies where most of our funding currently comes from um, National Institute of uh, Mental Health and National Eye Institute and other um, NIH um, agencies. And then the other thing, you know, that, and actually one of the reasons why I, I wanted to speak to all of you is that we're really hoping to engage more people in the community um, with our Kids in Brain Game Center. And so one big way to participate is to sign up for our studies. And so we'll send this out in a follow-up email as well. But if you go to bgc.ucr.edu forward slash sign up, we have a sign up sheet where you could express interests in the types of studies that you might want to participate in and that will contact you when there's offerings. And one thing I think it's worth noting is that, you know, some of these studies were able to loan people iPads to make sure that, um, you know, things are accessible and that, you know, people could do the studies in some cases in their own homes, especially now with the pandemic that's necessary. Um, and then the other area is that, you know, we're a university nonprofit, um, and that you know we are looking for donations to be able to help support our students and to develop our next inventions. Um, with that, um, that's the end of my slides, and I was hoping that we could now have a bit of a conversation. Thank you, Aaron. A lot of important research that you and your team are carrying out. So many thanks to you and, and your team members and an excellent presentation. Um, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, it's that time now, folks, where we uh, will take a few questions uh, from all of you. So don't forget to submit some questions in the bottom of your uh, screen in the chat in the Q&A feed, but I'll get things started here. Um, the first question is this, Aaron. So talk to us about the simple things that we can do at home or at work to help improve and test our vision? Yes, so, I mean, that's actually a, a somewhat difficult question and that, you know, the, the basic observation in terms of, you know, improving vision is that you need to basically do visual activities that are difficult. In real life, it's kind of tough. 
I mean, because a lot of the things that we see either are fairly clear or aren't particularly clear. And so um, the observation for a lot of our studies is that, you know, we use this term threshold, basically, you know, the threshold at, of visibility, we could barely see it. And that our training programs, we try to have people practice again and again, seeing things right at this threshold. And so what we're able to do is we're able to kind of measure each of your successes and failures and kind of, you know, keep our stimuli at that threshold. In daily life, and I think one of the reasons why, you know, daily experience isn't as good for training vision, even baseball playing isn't as good for training vision, is that you don't have enough of the experiences. And so there are ways you could try to create those. Like, you know, one idea would be that, you know, I could take off my glasses and, you know, hold a page in front of me and kind of find just the distance I could barely see and practice at that. Um, or, you know, you could participate in our studies where we design our stimuli to kind of really achieve this. And that um, this is why we want to make these tools available. Um, and by the way, this program sightseeing is one you could just download and try it yourself. And it is an example of this. Thank you. So folks, I want to remind you to sign up for uh, those test studies that uh, Aaron alluded to earlier. The next question, uh, Aaron, is um, uh, are you familiar with the disputed Bates method that English writer Aldous Huxley claimed pe helped people, helped him to overcome his limited vision? And if so, do you feel that it is a legitimate approach to improving vision? That's a good question. So I, I'm a little familiar with it. I mean, my understanding is it's mostly kind of a relaxation type of approach. Um, definitely, if you look at personal report, there's lots of people who have stated um, that they've been helped greatly by it. On the other hand, if you look at the scientific literature, there is no compelling evidence in the scientific literature that it works as proposed. And so it kind of gets back to that statement I showed in the beginning about, you know, the difficulties of the brain training field in general is that for approaches that really might help certain individuals, what we're lacking is the research, one, to systematically show that this is really the case, but also to identify, you know, let's say there are some people who really did get a benefit. Well, can we identify those people before they start the training? And then maybe we can show that for people with certain characteristics, that maybe it is highly successful. And for other people, maybe it doesn't work at all. Um, and I think this is the type of thing we need in order to resolve these controversies. And so I personally am open-minded, um, but skeptical about the Bates method. All right, the, the questions that are coming in, folks. Uh, so the next one here, Aaron, is what is the highest dimension of your basis? Um, example, how many brain parameters do you consider? <laughs> That's a great question, and probably too many uh, would be the answer in that the brain is very complex. And like, you know, when I was talking about vision, um, you know, I kind of mentioned I skip color. So if you want to include color, well, now we have three more dimensions to add. Um, I didn't include time or motion. Those are gonna be more. Um, there's some aspects of configuration that I was missing. And so the real difficulty in the field is figuring out, I guess, one, what are all the dimensions that are relevant? And then most importantly, which are the dimensions that are most relevant to each individual? So if going back to the baseball players, one thing that I didn't really mention that's like kind of some of the stuff kind of swept under the bed is that I showed you the average curves. So on average, all the players improved on contrastivity function. On average, you know, they all improved on acuity. But individually, you start looking at, well, some they improved acuity just in the left eye, not in the right eye. Some of them didn't really show much in acuity, but showed more in contrast sensitivity. 
And that on one hand, you might start thinking, well, okay, now these improvements I showed on average represent some people more than others. But think about, once again, the applicability of vision training for baseball. These players are highly skilled. For each of them, there's probably something different to just hold them back to the next step of performance. And so for some of them, acuity in one eye might help. For others, maybe they're just not doing as well in night games, and so contrast sensitivity is needed. And so the key to personalization is actually probably figuring out the relevant dimensions and what we're still working on, but this is why we're trying to run these large scale studies is to see whether we could figure out which dimensions are most important for which people. Thank you. We've got a, we've got a question from a uh, local elementary school teacher here in the Coachella Valley, and she wants to know if there are any studies done around dyslexia and or visual processing disorders and strategies for helping students with these challenges. That's a great question. And when I first came to UCR, and when like the first place I was thinking of, you know, real world applications actually was dyslexia. And there are some interesting examples of vision training and dyslexia that have shown promise. And then I've actually tried doing some studies myself. And the place where it's always gone south is getting enough participants. So like I have some wonderful case examples where um, some kids who tried my program who had gone through lots of clinics and such to help with their reading basically had really exciting results from using, in that case, what was optimized, but sightseeing is pretty much the same program. The problem though, is that it's been for a number of reasons difficult for me to um, you know, run enough children in kind of the right controlled study to be able to really address what well, it's possible as a coincidence. You know, maybe just those two months when they're doing my training were the critical two months where they're gonna unlock the reading potential anyways. And so this is kind of frustration in that um, there's so much compelling case examples. And I personally really think that this can work. And there's a whole, um, if you're familiar with the term magnetosolar hypothesis dyslexia. So with at least certain individuals with dyslexia that training with motion stimuli and low contrast stimuli um, seem to be really important, but not everybody with dyslexia because dyslexia is really diverse. And so this is one of those areas where I'm hoping to kind of both find the resources, um, but also the students who want to participate to be able to do a larger scale study of this type. Um, all right, we'll take uh, one or two more questions here. Are you interested in studying age-related patterns in perceptual learning as a moderator, uh, meaning uh, comparing children versus young adults and older adults? Absolutely. And so, in fact, the current project um, that I mentioned, currently it doesn't involve children in the funded study, although um, you know there's other pilots that I'd like to do in children, but the specific goal there is to not look at necessarily age as a continuous variable, but it really seems to be the case that there are differences between the studies you do, let's say in a bunch of college students and then um, a bunch of older adults. And so what we wanna do is um, in this study, um, we actually had proposed to run, I think it was about 1400 college students and about 600 older adults. And that's basically the older adults were trying a subset of the training methods we're looking at with the college students. And that we both want to look at kind of the moderators across those populations, but also there might be different moderators in older adults. And so that, um, you know, it's not just kind of age being a moderator per se, as, you know, it might be there's a whole shift in terms of which training programs 
are more effective, you know, at different age groups. Um, and so that's one of the primary goals of our study. Um, all right, let's take one final question. Uh, it says, Professor Seitz, are you doing any research to help improve um, or restore memory issues? Absolutely. So that's talk number three. Um, and so you can sign up now. So the sign up sheet, um, you know, is open to um, different interests. And so, um, and we have a number of memory studies, including one that also has the title mediators and moderators, because that's one of the central things of our approach is people are different and there are lots of different ways to train and we want to match them all. Um, and so if you go to participate um, webpage, you could um, sign up with the interest of memory. And if you wait a couple months, I'll tell you a lot more about the memory studies. Awesome. Um, let me see if there's any other questions trickling in. Um, there are um, here we go. Give me one second here. Um, I know Bob Bay had a question and I want to make sure that I get it to you. Um, uh, if Kelly or Maggie are there, would you please kindly put that question in into the chat at, at the top of the feed, please? One moment, please. The last question. Judy wants to know how she can lis listen to this recording. Judy, we're going to have this up uh, on our YouTube page in about a week or 10 days time. All right, uh, here's the question. Will this training improve my driving? So I'll give you a definite maybe. Um, so actually there's um, another group that has done some of these vision training studies that actually got a collaboration with an insurance company that they were able to train people and then look at accident rates. And they found some evidence that accident rates actually um, reduced with this type of training. So on the other hand, I haven't done studies that are specifically looking at that with the approaches we're using. And so it makes a lot of sense that would be the case. Um, there's some evidence in the field, but once again, you know, I want to be very careful as a scientist not to overclaim. And so um, that's something that we want to look into more with time. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, folks, we've reached that uh, time where uh, we'll have to say goodbye to Professor Seitz, and we want to thank you, Aaron, again, so much for your insightful uh, information and your lecture that you've provided, as well as the insights you shared in the Q&A portion of this. Um, and many thanks again to all of you for joining us uh, this evening. Please be sure to join us for the next Brain Game Center lecture by Aaron Seitz on hearing which is on Wednesday, March 24th. Uh, mark your calendars, please. You may register at uh, palmdesert.ucr.edu. And I want to thank uh, our Palm Desert partners, uh, especially uh, as well for joining us. And if you'd like to become a Palm Desert partner, um, go to our website. Uh, if you'd like to support the Brain Game Center as well, please visit thebraingamecenter.ucr.edu as well. Thank you again, all of you. Good night. Stay safe, and we'll see you at the next lecture.